They're giving me recommendations after the Mau Mau Rebellion video that we've been too mean to the British so far on this channel. So today we're going to take a look at the homeland and learn about the United Kingdom, a significant player in the Cold War as we've already seen, and show what they went through in the early years. It's a rocky ride, the story of a literal global empire at the brink of bankruptcy trying to modernize and hold a little island with a lot of potential power together. I'm your host David, and please go brew yourself a cuppa and get a biscuit or two while we take a look at the post-war United Kingdom. This is The Cold War. It's funny that I'm saying this, but we don't appreciate the true scale of the Second World War. I don't know if a human brain really could. The United Kingdom fought literally around the globe. It was a massive colonial empire with holdings in nearly every corner of the world. As German and Japanese expansion threatened their holdings, they expended enormous amounts of blood and treasure to stop them, as well as anti-colonial rebellions. But eventually, the war was over. Britain, with its allies, was triumphant, victorious, and utterly, utterly broke. So now what? Well, immediately there was an election. In 1945, the UK went to the polls to decide who would lead the country into peacetime. The colonialist elderly baby himself, Winston Churchill, tried to secure a victory for his Conservative Party by using his legend-building record of the Second World War. However, the Conservative government of the Great Depression had made many worry about the Tories' ability to manage a much more domestically focused country. Times were going to be rough. So in what any outsider would be shocked by, within months of the end of the Second World War, Churchill and the Conservative Party lost to the Labour Party and its leader Clement Attlee. A major factor in this defeat was the vote of soldiers and civilians who had fought and sacrificed so much over the previous six years and who now wanted something back in return. Labour would come to run the country in possibly its lowest state for six crucial years. So why don't we start there? Let's not mince words. The years were tough. Whether you think this was because of primarily economic conditions, of just fighting the biggest war ever, or Labour Party mismanagement, usually depends on how you want to feel about the Labour Party. Let's begin with money. Well, to put it simply, the British government had none, and their industries were in steep decline. After the war, the UK was not only entirely out of cash, but had racked up massive loans with the United States, IMF, and even Canada. To ameliorate the dire circumstance, and deny socialism from rooting in Britain, the US gave the UK grants totaling up to $33 billion in today's money through the Marshall Plan. To keep British industries afloat, the Attlee government decided to put some of them under public ownership. The government nationalized several vital utilities and industries to the tune of about a fifth of the economy. Though the government saved these industries, they didn't change in many ways many British socialists wanted with more centralized economic planning. This disappointment caused a rift in the Labour Party between new and old left, indeed a future video in and of itself. The Tories used nationalization as a cudgel against Labour for apparent mismanagement. Whether it was actually mismanaged, well, that depends on how you feel about the Labour Party. This was also the time where the UK, along with many other countries, joined modern nation-states, with one major exception, in building a stable welfare state. This included the UK's most beloved institution, the National Health Service, or NHS. But it also installed a social security system for sickness, unemployment, and even funerals. All being said, in a tough economic time, the Attlee government oversaw a low unemployment rate, only about 3%. But there were still many ways British people felt the pinch of austere times. Many houses had been destroyed in the war, and the government only had so many resources to rebuild. So housing became a significant issue. Wartime rationing also continued, and even expanded to new foods as the British struggled to feed their segment of occupied Germany. This would continue well into the 50s. The UK was also in a tough time abroad. 
global empires don't come cheap, and with the end of the war came a lot of desire for countries to go their own way. I wanted the Fleetwood Mac song for this as a bit, but Nurlin tells me we didn't have the budget. And I'm not going to sing because, well, you know. The economist John Maynard Keynes, yes, that Keynes, of Keynesian economics, well, he suggested that it was time the British started scaling back its empire. This advice was ignored, but the 1947 loss of India and Pakistan did make imperial spending drop quite a bit. Many tasks like maintaining a global fleet, rebuilding economies, and generally the self-imposed job of being world policemen was being ceded to the United States. Britain even considered further disarmament before the US insisted they rearm for the Korean War. Britain also was a founding member of the United Nations and NATO, and a staunch ally of the US in the fight against communism. It might be hard to see where they fit, as so far in the Cold War they seemed more preoccupied with maintaining colonial power, but they did cooperate with the US, mostly. Cut off from American help, the UK developed its own nuclear weapons program detonating their first weapon in 1952. Being part of the Atomic Club comes with several advantages geopolitically, making you, well, virtually invasion-proof. Just a heads up, I am glossing over a few big stories in and of themselves. The Korean War, the independence of India and Pakistan, the UN and NATO, these are all stories we've covered here on the Cold War in previous videos. So if you want the whole picture, pop some popcorn and go for a binge session. By the late 1940s, the Labour government that had swept into power in 1945 had eroded much of the support they had gained in that 45 election. Austerity, epitomized by continued rationing, was very unpopular. Labour won re-election in 1950, but just barely. The Conservatives were able to capitalize on this turmoil. They managed to win back power in Parliament in 1951, the legendary Empire baby Winston Churchill, back in power as Prime Minister. Important to mention though is that the Conservatives did win despite Labour receiving nearly a quarter of a million more votes. That's just one of the wonders of the first past the post electoral system. It really is the gift that keeps on giving in countries like my own here in Canada. Now, despite the change in government, the movement to lower economic controls was a little more muted than one might expect. There was a post-war consensus for a few decades which maintained a continuity of programs even when the government changed hands. So nationalization remained in place, unions remained strong, and the welfare state stayed together. There was some privatization and relaxing of economic controls, however, it was relatively limited. What followed was the 1950s, called a golden age for post-war Britain. Unemployment was at an all-time low, and I mean including our own current moment. They would never see unemployment so low ever again. The empire began to crumble, but the UK itself seemed to be able to remain relevant. Standards of living increased, but despite this bright economic patch, it should be pointed out that the growth of the British economy was slower than its neighbouring countries like France and West Germany. And Britain was receiving bloody noses abroad. The 1950s saw a significant dispute with Iran over control of oil supplies. There were also many attempts to challenge British power abroad, leading to successful independence movements such as the Mau Mau Rebellion in Kenya and the Malayan Uprisings. You can also learn about them on this channel. And to cap off, what story of Britain in the 1950s would be complete without the royal family? In 1952, King George VI died and the increasingly ceremonial royal crown passed down to his eldest daughter, Claire Foy. I mean, Queen Elizabeth II. The first, and to this date, the only British coronation to be televised because at 93, she's still kicking it as the Queen. Charles is never going to get that crown, is he? When Winston Churchill eventually resigned in 1955, he was succeeded by Anthony Eden. You'll get to know him through our Suez Crisis videos. The Suez Crisis in Egypt devastated his career, and his term in office only lasted until 1957, where he resigned and was replaced by Harold Macmillan. So this is where Britain stood by the end of the 1950s. The island nation had been through a hell of a lot in the last two decades, going from global empire 
to one struggling to keep itself afloat. Through some shaky times and some very dark, desperate attempts to keep hold of other people's land, the UK had to find a new, albeit smaller, role in the world. It had modernized, it had nationalized, and still much more drama is yet to come. We'll check in with the UK again as we move forward through our Cold War journey, and to get that, make sure to subscribe. We hope you've enjoyed today's topic, and to make sure you don't miss those future episodes, please make sure you subscribe to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com. We're also active on Facebook and Instagram at The Cold War TV. If you enjoy our work, consider supporting us via www.patreon.com slash The Cold War or through YouTube membership. This is The Cold War Channel, and don't forget, the trouble with The Cold War is that it doesn't take too long before it becomes heated. <laughs>